and we are live. Cool, the participants are going up. That's always my first fear at the start of these, that if the participants don't go up, then uh, we've got a problem. Uh, how are you both this morning? Very good, thank you. Very good, thank you. Raring for, uh, for a lot of tough questions to be coming in in the next hour? Absolutely not too tough. <laughs> hopefully they'll be nice to us. Yeah, hope, yeah hopefully. Give, it, give, it, um, give us your best questions, Darren. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, 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 I'll run it through it in a second. Um, I'm just going to allow for about another minute before kicking off. Okay. I know how many people are signed up, so I'm just waiting for those participants to go up. We were just saying before this about the uh, about the weather. I think uh, it seems to be a very British thing, to be honest. Talking about weather, I was yeah. chatting to our team in in Romania last week, and they were saying they don't really discuss the weather, but mm. it tends to be something that I talk about on every call ever at the start of the call. I don't know if this is a British thing. I think it is absolutely. I think, like you say, it's a, it's a bit of an icebreaker, isn't it? You know, it just exactly. gets everyone. Where are, where are you? And I think just because we're remote working now, you sometimes don't realise where people like geographically necessarily are. Yeah, like I um, because my uh, my dad's got a global role, but he's working from from Wales, and he was saying mm. about the the team that he's got sitting in Austin, Texas, and he was like, they have no idea where I work from because I always work remotely. But yeah. for, for all my team, though, except for the fact they can see my bedroom, I could be in the Bahamas for all day now. <laughs> um, you don't really need to do anything anymore. Right, let me share my screen as well. Um, so I think we can start and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll allow people to join. We've got about five minutes before we jump in into stuff anyway. So for all the attendees, thank you very much for attending. Um, the session today is talking about building sourcing strategies at scale. Um, so I'll, I'll get both of the guests to introduce themselves in, in a couple of minutes time, but today we've got Eloise Anzani and we've got Natalie Glick uh, on the call from UVU and IBM. Just some housekeeping, so if you can put all your questions, there's a Q&A section. I know that um, there's also a chat section, but if you can use Q&A, that will mean that I can then track everything on that side. And then if you want to be talking in the chat, use all participants just that everyone can see all those, those chats going on. They're not just directly going to, to the guests. Um, you'll get a new link from Zoom every day for webinars. I know that it definitely happens because I'm signed up and I've had two in the last 24 hours. Uh, and then talk to your friends about this. So if we, you, uh, uh, we've got a YouTube series that this is going to go on to. If you use the Twitter handle, uh, hackjob underscore co, and then LinkedIn, and then we've got a few hashtags. Wine tasting. Um, so we have a rule where if you attend four out of five of these um, of these in the series, you'll get invited to the wine, wine tasting. Uh, I will openly admit that I don't drink wine and I still attend these all the time. Uh, so even if you're not a wine drinker, they're quite a good social aspect and you get to speak to some thought leaders in the in the industry. So I definitely recommend attending. Um, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's the wine tasting. From an agenda perspective, uh, questions around today are going to be the differences between like sourcing and then sourcing at scale. Uh, and luckily, we've got two guests on here that will be looking at it from slightly different angles. So uh, we'll get their thoughts, how to manage expectations of stakeholders, um, brand awareness, and then we'll take you on to best practices for building a direct sourcing strategy. And that should be all of the, all of the housekeeping. Um, so... So I guess just building on that that original point, um, I will allow both of you to introduce yourself. So I obviously mentioned where you worked. But it'd be good if you could, um, one at a time, just take us through your own background. So do you want to start, Eloise? Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, hi, I'm Eloise Nzani. I'm the talent acquisition lead at UView TV. Um, so UView TV, we're a software company. We build the software and hardware for the set-top box, and we are in 3 million homes in the UK. Um, our, our shareholders, BT and TalkTalk, Talk, are the ones that sell um, our set-top box to our customers. Um, we're sort of hoping to be in 5 million homes by 2024. Um, and I guess in terms of my role, so I've been at UView now three years and four months. Um, I actually built the, the in-house team from scratch. So um, part of that was obviously investing in sort of technology, working out yet yeah, what our sort of direct sourcing strategy is, 
how we're going to sort of build those technical teams because 80% of our business is tech. Um, and I've been in tech recruitment now for 13 years, um, love tech, worked sort of with big clients, um, but also, uh, you know, consultancy side as well. Um, but yeah, looking forward to, to talking all things sourcing today. Natalie? Hey everyone, nice to meet you. So I'm Natalie Glick. I work um, as the strategic sourcing leader at IBM on a global scale. Um, I've been there for 18 months now. So for anyone who doesn't know IBM, we invented the barcode. Um, I didn't know if you know that. We also invented the cash machine. So on an everyday basis, you probably do use IBM created um, tools and technology in some way. Um, we probably, I think, also invented the first desktop computer. So um, it's a hundred year old company now, I think just over a hundred years. So it's pretty cool from what they've been doing and always inventing and evolving. They have 350,000 employees worldwide though. So pretty big firm and we hire about 40,000 people a year. So we, um, we do a lot of things at scale. Um, my background though, like Eloise is long-term recruitment background, agency first, and then moving in house. And um, sourcing has always been my definite favorite thing out of the whole recruitment process finding the candidates finding them in weird places using boolean searching and things and i do all the enablement at ibm for all of our training for sourcing as well as set the strategy globally as well amazing amazing and i didn't know about the barcode either that's the one bit i didn't know about um so that's interesting um i think the first question is going to be uh because of the size of your different organizations you're both going to take it from different sides. But I always find it interesting when we talk about sourcing, I think sourcing for free people is very different to sourcing at scale. So if you're looking at a project of 100 Java engineers, very different than if you were looking for free Java engineers. So I guess, what do you think is the biggest difference between sourcing and then sourcing at scale? And Eloise, if you start with this question. Yeah, absolutely. So really good question. And I think, as you say, there's definitely um, a massive difference in terms of, you know, I've got one or sort of three heads for a particular sort of role. Um, and so the way that I would sort of, I guess, um, define it is it's, you know, it's when, when you're sort of, sort of scale as such, it's, it's like building a project plan with timelines, you know, you need to understand what the priorities are, um, and, and really sort of work from there. But I think the most important part is that sort of, communication with your your stakeholders really understanding what are the priorities um you know how many um heads do we sort of need to land in in the first month through to the second month through to you know th for the quarter um and i think it's actually the communication is really really key that you really understand um what your hiring manager needs and, and what the business needs are and really sort of matching them so i think also understanding the market that you're operating within so you know, you've done your market research, you understand like, where are we going to find these, you know, these, these people. And I think it's about also um, having a really good plan of, you know, a, a multi-channel sort of approach to, to sourcing, really. You need to have lots of different touch points. Um, and I think, um, you know, having a really good talent pool is obviously really key. But at the same time, when you are sourcing at that scale, there are going to be other tools and platforms that you're probably going to need um, that investment in as well. Um, and as I say, for the sort of one or two roles, you know, you can pretty much, you know, rely on sort of, you know, your, your, your ATS um, and, and getting maybe a, a good sort of um, mixture of candidates in the process. But when you're talking, you know, hiring a team of 15 technical um, engineers, you need to really work out how many realistically can we actually land. Um, you know, and especially if it's a, a key project for a business where they do need them, you know, in sort of three weeks time, we know sort of what those lead times are. And that's what the data, you know, the data informs us of that as well. Amazing. And then yeah. Natalie, what's your scope on it? I was going to say, I completely agree. Like going, going firstly on that strategy meeting, going with insights around what does the market actually have out there? What is addressable? What do we have in our CRM that's addressable as well? And seeing where the gap is. So how much sourcing do we need to do to bridge that gap? Um, and really understand our own, uh, whether you have a CRM or an ATS holding that information, kind of pre-planning as well. What do we need to create an understanding? I, I like to reverse engineer that whole thing. So saying, okay, so we know we have to make 25 hires. So mm -hmm. how many people do we have to source to get to get to this? So what's our conversion rate at interview stage? What's our conversion rate at response rates? What's our conversion rate at 
sourcing to response rates and working back okay so we now need to focus on this is our number to to build our pipelines with i agree it shouldn't be a one channel approach it should be multi-channel so thinking about what maybe virtual events you could run in this day and age um what maybe um places you can go to maybe meetup groups and things that you could target as well um think about the storytelling as well around what are you trying to solve for and the problems you're trying to deal with within this project you're bringing these people in for to have some really engaging content to share as part of your outreach as well because there's so much work you can do to source for those people but if you're not going to engage them and get and close them to actually want to apply then all that sourcing effort becomes pointless unless you have a really good story to tell so that storytelling and knowing what your story is as part of that, I think is really important. Yeah, and I, I love that when you talk about funnel metrics just then, because I'm I'm big behind data, that I think that when you have the data and utilize the data, you can understand the story. And it's not just great to understand how many people do we need to get into process, but also mm -hmm. you can look at, you if you run it on a, a monthly or quarterly basis, and you look at that data, you could look at it and say, okay, so previously our, application to offer ratio was 17 and then you can look at that in a month's time and go actually it's dipped why is it dipped what have we changed in our process what do we need to adjust to because especially uh, like a uh, i think given you work at ibm it's an interesting example because you were talking about it's a hundred year old history a uh, hundred year old company the way that you sourced even 10 years ago is probably very different to the way you source now so i think understanding your funnels is hugely important and also maybe even A-B testing your outreach. So try two different ways of outreaching, maybe with a video content and the other one with just um, content and you know no, nothing really to bite. But we also found some research that we get better response rates on LinkedIn emails from 300, under 300 character messages to over 500. So thinking about even just the messaging and how you word it and how long or short it should be because it really affects the response rates. Yeah, it's a really good point, Natalie, actually, because on the LinkedIn, actually, I have I have found since here, my LinkedIn response rate has been like 90 percent, like the access to the candidates is so much easier. Candidates are able to interview with companies. Do you know what I mean? It's all like, it, again, like you say, actually, even now that we're in this sort of new way of working, I think that's even changed how our sourcing strategy slightly, too, because people are easier to access. Um, and I think that's um, quite, quite, yeah, quite a change because sometimes LinkedIn can be hard for technical talent. You don't always think you're going to get through to those engineers. But actually, I found in the last quarter, the data we pulled is our response rate. We're getting a much higher response rate. And I, I think the um, uh, an interesting problem that has come as a result of, of COVID and it's it's both a blessing and, uh, and a hindrance is that the mm -hmm. amount of applications both of you are seeing is probably skyrocketed. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're the right applications, um, which causes another problem. So I don't know if that's something you're, you're both nodding. So I assume that's something that you've both seen internally at the moment. Yeah, we've got it currently. I mean, we're we're um, hiring for our technology grad scheme, and as you say, I mean, applications always for sort of that sort of level. We do see quite a lot of interest, but definitely already in sort of the first month, we're definitely seeing double the applications that we normally would. So as you say, it's about then right. How do we make sure we put a right process in in place for that and are, you know, as you say, are they the right source of candidates or, you know, do we focus on a sort of a more niche area in terms of trying to capture the right candidates for that campaign? Yeah, yeah same. We've been lucky. We've had, we've got a, a hundred year old brand. And so with that, we don't have a problem with applicants ever. Mm -hmm. And so actually it's then, do we hire the best applicant for the job or do we go and find the best person for that job? And it's always finding the right balance of, do we do the, the easy thing because we're hiring at scale or do we just actually think no I'm, I'm going to go and find the best people for this rather than oh I'll, I'll just accept what I've been given and, and go with that yeah yeah exactly um and another challenge I, I see within my own client base is as companies scale and uh, uh I guess from an IBM side what I'm talking about here is that you are, you're a huge organization but as you build new technology and new things come up you probably need to scale subsets of the business so other, other areas of the business so i think that what companies sometimes struggle with is as you scale keeping that same culture that is within the business uh and i know eloise obviously you view have, have changed the product set in the last kind of 18 months so how do you go about um when being involved in, in big hiring projects how do you personally combat a loss of culture 
Yeah, really, really good question. Because as you say, in the last couple of years, our, our business models changed to a SaaS model, which is is very different for sort of how our, you know, we were set up as our sort of joint venture and I guess the type of people that um, are working in our business. So now we're asking for more of a commercial mindset, it, you know, it's, and, and that's, that's different. Um, and I think what we've tried to do, I guess, in terms of sort of trying to keep the, the culture, as you say, is yes, we have moved to that sort of um, new, new model as such. But I think, as you say, you know, I think we've been able to keep our culture going because we still are very much, you know, at the, what, what is the heart of UView is being innovative, it's being collaborative and working together. And I think um, even through, you know, moving to sort of a new model, we've involved all of our employees to be part of sort of this new way of, of, of how we're going to be operating. And I think if you bring people on the journey with you, that's a mu that's a much easier. Um, but also we have like, we're now also re um, reevaluating our values at the company. Um, again, we sort of set up sort of lots of different like working groups in the business so that people still feel involved. So actually, as you say, it's not as if you're just bringing in new talent and, you know, there's sort of the internal people are, are not sort of singing from the same hymn sheet as such. So I think it is about also, um, you know, we try and obviously get people also to sort of go onto like a careers page and get a like a view of what it's like to work at UView and like I think Natsi was saying like video content things like that um we're going to be doing more of that to sort of really bring sort of out what our culture is today at UView because I think you know there's um we're changing as a, as a business so we are going to be looking for some different types of skills um but we're not going to forget that actually you know we've got lots of great technical minds that are so collaborative and so innovative that that will still always be the heart of you view, I think. And Natalie, what's your, your thoughts? Because you're probably looking at it from a different angle. No, I've, I've experienced this like a smaller scale. My previous company, we had 5,000 employees and they wanted to scale to 10,000 quite quickly. And culture was a huge part of that um, situation. Um, and one of our, their three pillars of the business was around being um socially aware and having a strong social impact a cause um and then at ibm diversity is probably at the core of everything we do as well so it's ensuring how do we as you scale as you grow you you're ensuring you're hiring allies and you're you're not gonna ruin what you're trying to build in diversity and inclusion um by scaling just you know and forgetting about culture so i think there's a couple of things you've got to think about from a sourcing angle it's looking at things like when you're on someone's LinkedIn profile, what do they do when they're volunteering and things? So do they volunteer? Do they think about the greater good? Are they, are they allies? Are they part of different organizations that you could see connected to some of the causes that are passionate about you? Do they spend their spare time volunteering at different organizations? Um, and then some of the keywords they use in the descriptions as well. So I quite like searching for soft skills. So I might use things like collaborative, innovative, um and put those kind of things just in one like bracket of searching or or, or, or this but keep those, using those words to really consider those skills when I'm searching because I want to find people who use those words because I would hope that because you can't you can't tell from looking at a CV if someone is has the, the culture that you're looking for but and I think you do that through interviewing and things and ensuring through your interview process you have some kind of cultural thought in whether it's a cultural interview or whether it's everyone is interviewing for culture throughout the process um there's also that view though that hiring for culture is also a problem because then you're hiring too many people like you and then you're not being diverse enough because there is a whole world out there of different people who have different views and different opinions and you kind of need that to be disruptive and so it's finding the right balance which is really really hard but i think especially with diversion diversity and inclusion you want to make sure you're not hiring people that are going to go against the inclusion piece which is so important so you don't you know it's really hard to remove racism from your funnel but in you know just by thinking about the allyship and things I always think that definitely helps me to find people I know will support my mission of inclusion and diversity rather than go against it the um we were going to get onto dni later but as you got us onto it earlier I, I think we can we can kind of play around with how i uh, was planning for this to to go out and i think that dni is such a hot topic for everyone in the market at the moment that everyone is talking about dni for great reasons I, it's not a bad thing it's, it's coming up a lot more than than ever before 
So I guess picking on that point a second ago, when it comes to DNI, it's very, very, very difficult because as you're trying to scale, at the same time, you need to bear that in mind. So how do you marry the the two of always being go, go, go and trying to get the right numbers, but also being hyper aware of the fact that you need to ensure there's diversity in, in your sourcing as well? Natalie, given that you, you started, do you want to take this question and then we can sure. go across? So we're quite lucky at IBM that we have a lot of technology. And so our chief analytics office has been working on um, a project for us right now where they are allowing us to see the market representation um, externally of the, of the skill set that we're looking for at the, the, the role level as well. So before we even start searching for a role, we will have the analytics to say with externally, this is what diversity looks like. So rather than shooting for 50-50 for a software developer in... I don't know, Manchester, um, where maybe that's not what it looks like. Um, yes, we can try and achieve that and get more representation of the world, but it's not representative of what is out there. So by at least having that data, you can go and approach it knowing what you should be trying to achieve and working towards versus trying to achieve the impossible, which sometimes yep. is 50-50. Um, the other thing I try and do from a sourcing perspective is try and get our recruiters to think about diversity first. So diversity is the hardest bit for everyone. And I know that, and it's tough, but if you do it first as part of your search, it's then done, it's out the way, you have worked on that diverse pool and then you can go and find everyone else. But it's that mindset shift of, I'm gonna go there first, I'm gonna do this first, because if I do it first, it's done. And then I can think about everyone else, but I haven't forgotten it. And it's never an afterthought, because I think the afterthought is the worst bit when you're like scrambling around thinking, oh my God, I've got this, slate to produce to my home manager and there's no women in it or there's no one diverse in it and it's really not where you know if you think every time you hire a non-diverse person you are affecting your diversity more Great. so it's always thinking and you can't make that decision of who who the best person is for the job mm -hmm. within a slate but at least if you are representing a diverse slate to your hiring managers you are doing your bit for diversity. The hiring manager's responsibility then is to decide who the best person is. And that should be non-discriminatory. It's the best person for the job. But I always think you have a special gift in sourcing that you can invite diverse people in. Whereas with applications and with referrals, you, you don't really control that. People opt into your brand and they choose to be um, part of your organization. You can invite people. So by definitely, I think sourcing for diversity, you're inviting people to apply you are really pushing that needle of diversity a lot more. And I always think you should do it first. Yeah, yeah, I like that approach. Yeah. Eloise? Yeah, so I, I guess in terms of diversity, as you say, so such a hot topic, um, you know, with, with recent events. However, I think, you know, UV, we've been on the journey for quite a few years now. Um, and being a tech business, you know, we sort of started out with, you know, our focus was, you know, women in tech um, because, you know, we didn't have, um, a great presence of sort of female engineers and teams and we really sort of managed to um, sort of move move the dial on a lot of that and actually we did partner with um, Hacker Job um, to do some of the the recruiting in in that particular area um, and it's great now to see that actually we have got a really good presence in actually um, most of our technical teams we've got female engineers um, we we had one one particular area of our business which is really sort of um, you know, sort of C++ focused and that middleware layer. And we managed to hire, already got sort of two females in that team. And, and that was un, unheard of. And so we, we sort of put a lot of um, focus in, into the women in tech piece, because again, I think diversity is such a broad topic. And just, you know, as, as I think Natalie sort of said, you know, putting a metric in saying we need, you know, 50-50, that's not always the way that you're going to be able to, to, to move that dial. And we do know that diversity it's not going to happen overnight. It's a journey and it, and it takes time. And I think, you know, as, as a business, you have to, um, you know, in, invest. So I think what we've, we've tried to do, actually, we sort of, we hosted quite a number of events in our office to show candidates who you, you were, what we were like as an organisation, set up like a couple of demos for people to, to come in and see sort of the types of um, work and projects that we, we work on, which allowed us to sort of um, build, um, you know, our, our brand awareness of, of who you, you are um, and increase that brand awareness. But also, again, with um, our, our graduate um, campaigns, we're in our sort of third year of running our technology grad programme, but we've been partnering with um, 
particular companies where they actually will help us with going out into those um, diverse diverse pool of candidates. So BAME backgrounds, you know, STEM subjects, female, um, and that again, it's, it's all about that brand awareness, putting UView on the map so that people know that, you know, this is us as an organization. And actually we do know that having a diverse pool of candidates does actually change the productivity in a, in a team as such. Um, the other part that we're also um, looking into, so actually we've, we've just run a number of um, workshops for our business internally. Everyone's been on, inclu on inclusion training because again, we're now trying to, you know, uh, I guess work out what is, what is our story to, to, the, to the external market? What, what does inclusion mean to you, View? You know, how do you feel you can be a part of that? And we've actually also just set up a DNI committee um, in the last three months that are sort of kind of going out to the business to, to get a, a sort of sense of feel of what is sort of diversity and inclusion to them so that we can actually then open that up to the wider audience. Um, but similar to Natalie, actually, I think, as you say, the, the, the diversity piece also comes, I guess it's easy to sort of, judge what your talent pool of, of, of candidates is through the recruitment process. So our ATS actually um, pulls that data in terms of all the, the diversity. So I produce on a quarterly basis um, data around ethnicities, around gender, around age, um, age range. So I've got a real good feel for and, and actually through all stages of the recruitment pipeline so I can understand where, where are we getting candidates? You know, is it a recruit screen? We actually have got, you know, a number of different ethnicities, but where is the drop off? Is it at actually then the interview or the offer stage? But it's great now that I've got that data so that we can actually as a business see externally what our pipeline looks like, but also we've got my, you know, my colleagues in our, in our HR team that look at the internal diversity as well. But part of also what we're trying to do as well is we're trying to remove that bias in, in the recruitment process. And I think that's for a lot of companies. So as you say, technology now allows us to do a lot of that. So we're potentially looking at um, maybe using a platform for our sort of coding assessment piece um, to really, again, open up so that we've actually got a more diverse pool of candidates coming through that pipeline. Now that we can sort of see that, what the data is telling us and then work on it. Um, so, yeah. We've had a, a quick question in the chat, and I know I think I know the answer to this. You, you use Lever internally, don't you, Eloise? We do. We use Lever. Yes. There you go. A, a self promotion for Lever there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I love what both of you have, have said, to be honest, on the on the diversity piece. That I think that companies are a lot of companies are doing something around diversity. Are are we all doing it because it's a hot topic, or are we doing it because we really care about changing mm -hmm. diversity? And I think that you should be hiring the right person for the job, not necessarily hiring just because your CTO tells you that they want 30% female in that team by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So what I loved about what you both said there was that you're, you're thinking about diversity within, the, within your processes in the funnel rather than thinking, do they get to the end of the funnel? Because if they don't, mm -hmm. then maybe there's a question of, okay, that currently within the market, we're going to struggle on this area. But where we can change diversity is in, in this area. So I loved, Natalie, when you were talking about how you utilise the, the data of the market overall to make decisions, because that's what I think companies need to do. It's not that you need to uh, you need to get to 50% in front end. You might need to get to 50% overall, which can be propped up by, I don't know, um, C Sharp or something like that. So it's taking a more holistic approach rather than just making a... a uh, a quick decision on how you're going to do it yeah. another good tip actually is on if you have a linkedin recruiter seat now you can analyze your um email analytics around uh, diversity so you can actually see do you get better response rates from men or women as well so it just gives you a just a better view of are your messages more heading towards men or women or is it equal yeah. and you know it's, it's just a good inverted look at yourself and how you're approaching it as well as um you know, where Eloise can see it from a, a bigger holistic view of her entire team. I think just you as a human being able to analyze what am I doing correctly and can I do better? Um, and I always think, you know, when you think about agile ways of working and things, how can I always improve? And, and looking at your messaging response rates and things, can I improve my messaging to females so that there's, I'm more likely to get a response because of my, the way I write a message versus, and it's the same with job descriptions. And we talk about textio and things, mm -hmm. having job descriptions that are more 
gender neutral than bias towards any particular gender yeah yeah exactly and I, I think that the um what's interesting when you when you look at the kind of the messaging is if you are failing to to get females reaching out to you or applying is it because they don't uh sorry i'm, I'm going with females but diversity as a whole um is it because they can't see someone within organ the organization that is similar to, to mm -hmm. themselves so no one to aspire to in your organization so that i've always seen as a as an issue i was listening to a tech podcast a couple of months ago and they were talking about uh to their listeners about why they previously struggled to get diversity in their engineering teams was mm -hmm. because they only have white males that do any of their content so therefore if i'm if i'm a black female i can't see anyone like me in that organization so i may not apply so i think it what you're saying about the messaging and is that different for one gender against another or one ethnicity against another if you have those analytics you can make a decision better around what you're doing um so i guess taking us into onto stakeholder management because that's also very uh very hard when you're when you're hiring a scale so i guess going back to the to the original point when you're hiring for one perfect candidate compared to when you're hiring for a project of 24 perfect candidates in abbreviated commas um the stakeholder management probably needs to be slightly different because it's going to take time to find all of the right people so within your own teams how do you manage stakeholder expectations uh, Eloise, so, sorry, do, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, absolutely. So as I say, I think I will sort of go back to, I think communication is key, is, is the key ingredient to anything. I think as long as you are communicating with your stakeholders, they sort of know, you know, what your plan is, what's landing, what's, you know, what is the, the state of play? I think communication is, is always really, really super important. Um, I think also when you're hiring at scale, um, I tend to find that I would have a regular sort of weekly catch up in that manager's diary, be able to walk them through exactly where we are in terms of where are we on the plan? What are we, what's it looking like in terms of candidates? Have I got any outstanding candidates that I need hiring managers to review? How many interviews we've got coming up this week? You know, do we need to walk through what that interview process is going to look like? Because actually you say you need this person next week or whatever. So how, how are we going to accommodate to make sure that we get through the whole proper technical competency interview process in that time, if that's what you want us to do. So I think, you know, working really, really closely, have, having those regular check-ins with them, um, I think is, is, is super important. But also I think the other part is, you know, um, providing the, the data and insights. Look, this was the last time we sort of had this size of project. This is what the data is telling us. And I think being um, being open and honest. Look, you know, the, the way that I've always sort of liked to work, I would never say something to someone if I don't think that we can deliver it or we can't do it. Be really open and honest. If there, you know, if you spot there is going to be an issue or actually look, what we're looking for here is a unicorn. And actually the market is just not going to give us that type of person right now. We're going to need, you know, you're going to get 75%, but I do need, you know, your team and some of your team leaders to actually um, be able to train these people because actually that's going to open up the market more. So I think it is all around also that data and that insights that you can provide at that, you know, at those meetings that, you know, show you that, show them actually that you're the expert in your field and this is what I can deliver for you. But communication for me is key. I don't think Eloise has left me much to say um, on that one. So yeah, we actually, we start every new role with an intake like strategy meeting with our hiring managers where we set expectations with them from the get-go we also have a social contract we create with them each time we approach a new role to ensure that we agree ways of working similar to like SLA and stuff but um, because we work in a very agile way we really want to ensure that that social contract is is there and, and everyone's agreed to it and it, it's the way we're going to work and it will vary depending on the hiring manager's needs and expectations and time frames and things so um I definitely think coming to that intake meeting with those data insights that Eloise mentioned, knowing exactly what, you know, you've done your research beforehand, maybe even come with some um, suggested candidates that you've already sourced so that you can get that feedback instantly at that meeting to know 
am I on the right track or on the wrong track with what I've assumed this role actually is doing? Um, and by getting that feedback from them really early on, you can then go away and try and hit far more quality quickly than going back and forth and getting negative feedback from them and then having to start again, if you can get that information really early on. So always come to that meeting with maybe three or four sourced candidates, have a few diverse candidates in there just to see, you know, is there any bias you can really see straight away as well. So that once you walk away from that meeting, you know kind of what they want, what they don't want, um, and you've agreed those timescales as well. Yeah, no, I think that proactive approach is, is brilliant. Um, I think that if I'm a hiring manager, and someone's coming to me with, with um, I, I like to use the, the term solutions, not problems. So come to me with what you, th this is something that you're, we're going to be up against, but how are we going to solve that? Like, what would you suggest we do? Because I think that if I'm a hiring manager and you walk into a room with me and say, okay, you're looking for uh, female tech leads in Java, uh, I'm not going to be able to find them. As a hiring manager, I'm like, okay, well, how come? Like, what can we do around this? And I think if you're not going, coming in with, solutions about what we could do instead you lose some of that um some of that trust with the hiring manager so that would be my suggestion i don't know what both your thoughts are on that i probably would tell my hiring manager just never say that they're looking for a female anyone um at the start of a search yeah. because i think yeah, that's really inappropriate <laughs> yeah. and then it's, it's the man it's the expectation management it's coming in with um you know this is what the market has available to just doing that research because linkedin recruiter when without having an insights uh, seat you can still get loads of insights so going there and saying you know i've done this search for you already i understand what the market looks like this is what i'm going to share with you and let's say they wanted them in London, but actually there's more sitting in Southampton or something. I, you know, I'd even give that kind of insight of, you know, are you open to, and it's it's kind of giving those, trying to get the negotiation points. What are they willing to negotiate on? You want someone with 10 years Java, but hey, look, it actually says the majority of people are sitting within six to eight years. So are you open to someone with maybe slightly less experience? And just finding what is their negotiation point. And then when it comes to technical tools as well, and I think Eloise mentioned she has a lot of technical recruitment, let's say they wanted containers and they said, I want someone with Docker experience, but actually you found some other containers that matched it and Docker wasn't the only option. And you can ask those questions, you know, would you consider this, this and this as well? Or, yeah. or and I'll also ask them, okay, so what other words might people use that mean the same thing? So with Java, you might have like J2EE, JEE. So when you think of your search, the high manager is going to know that technology better than you are. So really asking what else, what else, what else? really trying to hone in what are they negotiable on so that you can they want 100 percent. you're probably going to give them 80 so what are those 20 percent that you've got that wiggle on yeah great Eloise, I don't know absolutely if you and i think also i mean i think what we've um we've started to do as well because obviously a lot of our tech recruitment as you say when you're sort of hiring at scale it is really sort of the external market route however we have now started you know saying to them you know think actually about people internally maybe there's people in you know our cloud team that maybe want to move into one of our other teams actually they've already been in our business maybe two three years okay maybe they need some upskilling in one of the technologies but actually in terms of you know how long maybe it takes eight to ten weeks to maybe find a person on the external market you can have someone internally moved over within four weeks in your team and already you know actually contributing really, really very well so I think also turning you know as, as, as Natalie said sometimes um, you've just got to turn things on their head a little bit and because sometimes they don't always they don't always think like that as you say and I think that's again where we come in as the experts where we thought oh actually yeah that person instead of them you know well, that person might be ready to sort of leave the business but you know if we present a great opportunity to them in another team they might think again so I think you know it is it's, it's all about that. And I think it is just being really realistic. And the way I like to operate is, yeah, be really open and honest, have those frank conversations. Don't be afraid. Don't commit to something if you're not going to be able, able to, to, to deliver. So I'm going to, I'm going to chuck a few curveballs from the, uh, the Q&A. <laughs> so be prepared. Um, so I really like the, this first one. So um, just building on that, that previous point, where do you both as organisations start that market research like what what is your process when it comes to that market research um natalie i'll throw this to you first so i mentioned earlier on linkedin recruiter there is a really easy way of going to do that um, and you can pull in um when you're doing your search on the top 
as you scroll down, it comes up and it says like insights and you can just click on it and it gives you years yep. of experience. It gives you um, universities, companies that have those people, the movement of people and things. But then there's things like Stack Overflow uh, reports online and, and um, GitHub reports around software developers. What are they looking for? What are their reasons for moving jobs? Where do most of them sit? What's the gender population look like and that kind of thing. So, um, and I use things like Glassdoor to look at company feedback and things and interviews and things like, I just do loads and loads of research to understand um, are people unhappy? Where should I target people? Because let's say someone's Glassdoor rating has just dropped, there's something wrong going on there, maybe we target those people. So really thinking about um, the approach, you know, market research is so much data out there if you want to go and find it that there's lots of different sites now you can just go and do that there's loads of sites you can look at competitors you could put in um, a tool and look up the competitor and you get a whole list of competition that you can then maybe search from so think about i love data i love going online i love researching and there's a really cool book actually i just bought called the joy of search if anyone wants so to i saw you it. post that on LinkedIn. yeah it's really cool it's a guy from google a researcher who talks about he, he asks a question then how does he find it on google and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper and i think that's kind of where my mindset sits is like how do i get more how do i find out more how do i find out more so with any kind of market research i'm always looking for more and more and more data wherever it is online and there's so many places you can find things online that don't just think linkedin is your answer and if you haven't got a recruiter seat you can't do it but mm. also when you do a linkedin search you can be like okay so how many people have arrived in my search? Okay, so there's a thousand right now. Let me put in Accenture into that. Right, there's 300 at Accenture and there's this many at that place and start looking at who you know your competitors to be and where they sit. So you can at least mm -hmm. go to your hiring manager with that data that you've gone and gleaned from your searching. Uh, Eloise? Absolutely. I mean, Natalie touched on a lot of a lot of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, we actually did an exercise with with a, a, an, an external party, actually, where we were trying to map out the C++ market. Um, and, you know, because we, we look for people with that real sort of, well, C++ is quite an old language, but also we look for them to sort of work at like the middleware layer and like the the Linux, like the kernel drivers and, you know, Linux is the operating system. Um, and, you know, we were just finding that, as you say, you know, like the London market has, has got, you know, still a lot of these engineers, but actually over in Europe, there's there's quite, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of big uh, tech hub um, over in sort of Eastern Europe where sort of we thought, right, so should we look to maybe set something up there or, you know, is that is that where we should be putting our efforts? Um, and so we used um, a company called Horsefly for some for some data. Oh, they actually, um, we actually met them at uh, one of our one of the in-house recruitment events um, and managed to sort of um, have a chat with them and, and, and get the get the data, which really helped us just sort of, as you say, like map out the market, because I'll be honest with you, it's only myself and Danny and my teams so were quite a small recruitment team. We do all the all, all the uh, all the recruitment. It's all direct. We haven't used agencies in sort of well the three years that we've really sort of been in house. Um, but we've got limited sort of recruitment. Probably you know a lot of sort of small companies do have. So you know sometimes you you know you have to be quite um, inventive about the way that you go about finding your data. As you say, but you know also LinkedIn obviously has massively helped us as well on our sort of journey and and stuff. But also we found too. Um, speaking to the engineers in our business getting you know having sitting down having a chat with them where do your you know where do your friends work where do, you know good people know good people and actually um you know found that's really a great resource as well i think sometimes you um you forget that that actually you've got all these fantastic people in your business so go and talk to them because i'm sure that you know they they have that information and we have got you know really great people that really have sort of helped us in that um, but as you say, um, it is about, you know, there's lots of books um, and, and resources that you can go to. Um, it's just about, you know, there is also too much of the stuff as well. And it's like you're trying to, like, get through the, the stuff, the content that you actually want. But I think, yeah, the data and insights drive so much of our recruitment um, world today, because I think that's, you know, that tells us a story. And the uh, there's a question that went in the Q and A while you were chatting just then. I think there was uh, what you just said about um, it, it's almost asking the question about do you we have enough time to do all this market research? And my answer mm -hmm. would be yes because I I think that if you take a step back, you will find the right answers. I think that sometimes some of the the best recruiters I've ever worked with 
I've had to sometimes say, look, if you take it, take a step back, this is actually what's going on. Go talk to your, your hiring managers, go get some advice off them, because like you say, they are the experts in their own market. We are experts in terms of knowing what is in the market, but they are experts mm. within their own technology. So I think taking that step back and going with an approach of, I want to understand what's going on rather than just sourcing, sourcing, sourcing will add huge amounts of benefit further down the line. And I also think just from that question, you've got to be really strict with your time management when it comes to search because it can be long and it can be boring and you can get search fatigue. But if you time box it to say, right, I'm going to block my diary every Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday for an hour I'm sourcing and you block that, you know, maybe 10 to 11 a.m. every day, all those days, three days a week, you time box it, you do it and you stop. Um, you won't want to carry on because you're getting into it, but you also yeah. might just not like it. Some people don't like sourcing. I, I've accepted that in my life. Um, but I definitely think you have to set aside time for it. One thing we do do, and I did at my previous company as well, is we had power hours, sourcing hours. Yep. where you get everyone in the team and Eloise the two of you sourcing for that role together so where it's really tough you just take that hour together you might be searching in different places but you can build such a faster pool of people if you're all there together so you start the first five minutes just set an expectation this is what we're looking for these are the kind of words I would use in my search or just maybe have a LinkedIn project you can share with each other get loads of people into that project and then stop after the hour you it's a, we probably get 100 to 200 people within an hour when we get the whole team together to do things love that and louise have you used uh, an approach like that before is there any yeah actually it's um yeah we called it like power hour too so yeah we used to sort of get into a room actually we just even used to also put some music on as well just to get people like in a zone as you say just you know, right, yeah, we're in this meets room, we're all going to sort of focus on this role, like this is like a real niche role, but as you say, go through different avenues though, of how you're going to find those candidates. Um, and we've, you know, found that really useful because I do think, as, as Natalie was saying, you have got to like literally down tools, block it, so you've got the time to focus. Because it's so easy now with technology, you slack going off and you've got this and, you know, you have to just, yeah, block that time to actually because it does it does take time as you say you you might need to reach out to hundreds of people you know for a particular role to even get a response or like you say you might reach out to 50 people you might not get a response then it's like right so what am I going to do now what's you know what's my next and actually when you have great minds around you that are in that set in that same zone you'll be amazed what you can come up with and actually you just think oh yeah why didn't I think of that but it's you know and I think that's what's great about being in recruitment is that I think, yeah, you know, if you get great minds together, you can come up with some great strategies around, I didn't even think of that, just because I was just so, so focused on one doing one thing. And no, I, I, I think it's funny that you used the word collaborative earlier, Natalie, because I think that that's something we sometimes miss uh, mm -hmm. as an industry, that we talk about how we want to hire collaborative people into the teams that we're hiring for. But then if I you're think I realised it comes from an agency background. We've yes. learned as agencies, you're, this is your desk, this is you've got to make money, you've got to make deals, and you kind of become this lone soldier and you're not a team player. And then you go in-house and all of a sudden it's a team, but no one's really thinking of it that way. And I'm really trying really hard at IBM to remove that individual contribution concept and be a lot more around this is this hire is a hire for IBM it's not just a hire for you this is a team sport yeah. and we are really working for the greater good not just for your this one person and changing that mindset is really hard um yeah. but sourcing together and saying you know what yeah this isn't for you but you'll get your turn and we'll source for you soon but just come together and, and work together it, it really it changes the way people feel about each other and I think it, it brings that team so much closer together and I I, I think from from experience of some of the, the enterprise clients I, I deal with, something that sometimes surprises me, I'm not suggesting this happens even, or even for your businesses, is that they'll look at the, the recruiter may look at a candidate and say, oh, they're not right for my role. But then I sometimes think, but they're right for someone else's role. Like, are you passing this along? It might not be right for your role, but I'm sure you've got someone in your team who they would be great for. So I would love to see in the industry that change slightly in some of the enterprise businesses about that collaboration. Like talk to your colleagues. So they're working on, you're working on a, a tech lead role. They're working for a head of engineering role. And you feel like mm -hmm. this person would rather be more hands-off. 
okay, have you spoken to them about that candidate? Or even just add them to the CRM so that someone else could find them one day yeah. and they're there because you've had that conversation and they are interested in you, but maybe not for your role. So it's always about paying it forward because hopefully by paying it forward, you will reap those rewards eventually too. Yeah, exactly. yeah and I think um, also just lastly on that as well, like the sourcing bit as well, we've sort of as well sat down like with the manager and given them a life into what, what a recruiter does, like yeah. taking them actually through that process and like, you know, getting like having 10 on 10 profiles on your clipboard and just seeing like how you perceive that that candidate to what the hiring manager does. And it's just again, it's great learning because you think, oh, actually, you know, I thought they maybe were the ideal candidate, but actually I can now understand from a manager's point of view, right? Okay, so that's maybe why they're not. But it opens up that conversation, like you say, where I can go, oh, actually, I think maybe, maybe Danny and my team's working on that role. So that candidate might be good for that. And it's just all them little moments where you just think, ah. Oh, brilliant you know and just yeah it's just great another thing i was gonna say get your hiring manager to do that power hour with you so that they can actually add value because they're the ones that are saying you know as you're going along and putting people in they're giving you feedback instantly so that you definitely get on the right track really quickly with it love that that's a really good technique i like that a lot um so i guess there's a final point we've got we've got just under 10 minutes left I just want to touch on, on brand awareness because obviously both of the brands you work for have got great brands. But I think that given where you were speaking about Glassdoor earlier, a mm. bad brand can can be hugely detrimental to, to what you're you're trying to do. So what techniques have you used in the past to make sure that one, your your brand is great? Like what are you doing around your brand to make sure your brand is is singing out to candidates, but also making sure that those candidates outside of the world we live in right now so six months down the line when not everyone needs to be applying for jobs hopefully um to make sure that people organically reaching out to you anyways do you want to start yeah so i think brand awareness so we've done a, again you know part of sort of obviously setting up like an in-house function we didn't really people didn't really know who you were so we literally had to get like a brand together and that was about promoting you know our employer brand and say so going out to the right meetups, the right events. Um, you know, we we done a couple of sort of silicone milk roundabouts, and that was more again just for the brand awareness. Just know that you view are hiring. This is you view. This is what we do. Um, and also the the other part to it, I guess, um, is that we've um, we we sort of done a big revamp on our careers page. Um, and part of that was again talking to that external audience. If people went on to, it's just something you know little that. Our careers page used to be at the bottom of our web of our website, so you know that doesn't really sort of you know no candidates would necessarily know to go on the careers part. So I managed to sort of get that moved up to the right hand corner. We've got a careers page, make it more interactive. Got some really good video content of our developers and what it's like to work at UView. Also shows our exec team in terms of the di- you know the diverse exec team that we've got. So you can find out you know also what are our values. You know what do we sort of live and, and breathe. And, you know, I think just those little things made a difference, but also partnering with Glassdoor as well. Um, As you say, people now go to Glassdoor so much to understand what is it like to actually work at that company. Um, And I think the power of Glassdoor now, you know, one, like you say, one negative comment can be detrimental, especially if you don't respond to it in the right way. And it is about addressing those things. And I've had, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we have had a couple of comments where, probably didn't put us in in the best light but what did I go and do but well you know that's not a great comment but let's go and speak to the hiring manager right let's work together on what's our response to this what you know what's your sort of thoughts but like we've got to speak to this person because clearly they they sort of feel this way and I think again it's it's being open it's being transparent um I think you know that that's how you have to be I think the other part um to sort of brand awareness um as you say is yeah, just just I think if you're giving more of a of a, a door into your company, what it's like, I think that only only you only reap the rewards really from that. I mean, we'll probably actually do another refresh now around the whole DNI piece. We actually need to do put more on into that. Actually, I'm going to start talking about you know that we've got a diversity and inclusion committee, we have a well being committee, we have a social committee, all these things that I know, but actually the external market doesn't necessarily know. So you need to get it out there so I think it's something that again is such a big um task for companies because I think again it could be like a full it's a full-time job just doing that brand awareness piece even 
Um, and so sometimes I, we probably do sort of fall foul of not giving that as much focus as we can when you're in this sort of a small team. But, you know, I think, as you say, you, you have to do what, what you can do within your time. And it is all about sort of time management, as, as Natalie did sort of say earlier. Now, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. I mean, I was just thinking about um, IBM, obviously, I don't touch brand because it's a big <laughs> piece. For, yeah. But what we, one thing we are looking at is our employer value proposition. Why do people work for a company um, and why do they stay? So really starting to understand that. So doing some, maybe some um, interviewing with your employees to say, you know, why do you love working here? And even employment surveys just say they're happy, what makes them happy, you know, all the good things that your brand is about so that you can then talk to that and maybe even make videos as Eloise mentioned of your employees to see why they're here why they do what they do so really understanding your employer value proposition um, is really important I think one of the biggest problems companies have is sourcing without knowing that and sourcing without having any of those videos and those that content to share because I think it's really sourcing is hard sending messages and getting that messaging is hard unless you really know who you are and what you're pitching for and what stories you can tell because without the stories to tell it's really hard to change someone's mind to say hey you're sitting in your job you're happy these are all passive people when you're sourcing so they're happy in their jobs so what's going to make them respond to your message take out time to go and interview with you to speak to you to then have interviews to leave their jobs where they're probably really comfy and happy to go and join your company so it's really understanding why people work here what keeps people here and how I can express that in a message or in a story or something to entice someone to want to have a conversation with me. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of when companies talk about the fact that they survey candidates that have gone through the process about their process, because you might actually find that candidates are very interested in you, but for some reason they're turned off by your process. So understanding mm -hmm. when some joined you, how did you find that process? Or even some candidates have dropped out. Was there anything in particular in that process that you didn't like? I think can be hugely beneficial my previous company we were the second in Forbes second hardest company to ever interview for and that was like out there and everyone knew it and people didn't apply because they were scared that they wouldn't get yeah. their interview process and I completely agree and so it's how do you make someone feel comfortable enough to say I'm reaching out to you because I think you will get through my interview process and I'm going to help you to yeah. get through this interview process in some way by by holding your hand through it and talking you through what to expect at each stage so that they are not nervous to want to apply exactly um i think we've got to the end of the time i'm mindful we've only got three minutes left uh i'm going to throw one more curveball question at you um not hard one you should both be able to get this but what would you say is your number one tip from your experience when sourcing that anything we've not gone through so far is there is there a not silver bullet but something that you would throw out to the audience in this last two minutes about what you've tried in the past that's been incredible for, uh, for your processes Eloise, do you want us to start? Yeah, so I think um, talent pooling is just, a, I think, is, is a game changer um, in the respect that, you know, if you have, you know, built really strong relationships with candidates, they've gone through your process, you know, necessarily maybe they weren't right for the, for the, for the job at the time or they didn't decide to take it, you know, really nurturing that, that those types of candidates, you know, that, that those passive candidates is so important. I just think as recruiters, we, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's in our blood, really. We're always talking to people, you know, but I think, yeah, for me, talent pooling is, is great. For instance, you know, I, I can just give you an example of we, we had um, a particular person going on maternity leave this week. We only actually got the rec last week, but we've already managed to fill it today. I mean, amazing. That's, that's you know, for me, talent pooling, you know, being able to access candidates that you've regularly, you know, been, been catching up with, being able to sort of turn around and things like that. For me, that's where talent pooling is really, really powerful. And if you've got the right ATS in place, you you, you can make that work. Love that. Yeah, and I agree. Um, you've got your ATS. You've built all these people. You've got referrals in there. You've got previous applicants in there. You've got source candidates in there. Search it first before you go external. Search your own internal pools of talent. So you've got this talent pool you've been nurturing, you've been working on. Go and search there before you waste your time searching outside because you probably, as Ella already said, will fill that role with what you have available to you because they're warm candidates they've already applied to you they know you they want to work for you mm -hmm. um, and the referral people who are sitting there who maybe haven't have been overlooked in the past 
might be that one person that you do want to reach out to. So always go there first before you jump in a LinkedIn or whatever other tools you might use. Great. Um, so thank you to both of you for attending. Hopefully all of the participants or attendees enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and I'll make sure that if there's any other questions come through as a result of this, that we pass them on. Thank you very much, both of you. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much.